so we'd love to just welcome you to tonight's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CSEL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brad Cease, and tonight's topic is going to be looking at our updates in 2020 from around the world, and we really thank you for joining us. Join CCL's International Outreach Manager, Kathy Orlando, for a training that's going to highlight what's going on around the world in 2020 with CCL's network, what other countries are doing in terms of carbon pricing movements and citizen engagement, and how CCL as an organization is really engaging in all of these efforts as well as international civil society. And we have three esteemed guests with us. Uh, our main presenter tonight is going to be the wonderful Kathy Orlando, CCL's International Outreach Manager. She started CCL's first international chapter in September of 2010. And by the November of next, that next year, 2011, she was directing CCL Canada as a full-time volunteer. She now works as CCL's International Outreach Manager, where she draws upon many years of experience in science communication, organizational development, and volunteer empowerment. And joining Kathy tonight is the wonderful James Collis, CCL's European Regional Coordinator, who set up Portugal in 2015 for CCL, and then in 2018 started to work in Europe, launching the legally validated initiative for carbon fee and dividend, and it's now supported by 10 countries. James now leads CCL's Europe as chair and is focused on shaping the EU Green Deal, as well as helping launch COP25 in just a little bit helping raise ambition in Europe for efficient, effective, popular climate policy that scientists and economists agree works. Also joining us uh, remotely with a lot of the support leading up to tonight, but not on the call live, is the wonderful David Michael Tarungwa, CCL's Africa Volunteer Coordinator. David is a community mobilizer, passionate about environmental management, sustainable agriculture, and renewable energy and is dedicated to enabling sustainable development in Sub-Saharan Africa. And his passion is training people, both young and old, in best practices to address climate change, including carbon pricing. And with that, we are gonna have three learning goals, and then I'll pass it to you here, Kathy. Walking away tonight, hopefully all participants will have a chance to gain more familiarity with tools and resources to understand the momentum behind climate solutions like carbon pricing happening on the subnational as well as the international level internationally. They'll also have the chance to identify some more exciting developments that are happening outside of our work in CCL here in the United States. And really understand too, especially for those of you listening in, in countries throughout the larger world, how we can work internationally and how your work is important in building political will within your country and how you can get more involved. So with that though, the floor is yours, Kathy. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and we really look forward to finding out more. Thank you for that, Brett. That was a wonderful introduction and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Our agenda is as follows. I will be reviewing global maps and resources and then I will give CCL reports from around the world with the help from James. And while I'm doing this, I'm leaving you all with a question to ponder throughout this presentation. And it, the fall, it's the following question. So think of this as I'm presenting to you. How does our international work help your work? So let's begin with the end in mind. That's how I project manage. Our focus at Citizens Climate Lobby is to create the political will for climate solutions by enabling individual breakthroughs in the exercise of personal and political power. Our niche in the environmental movement is empowering grassroots volunteers globally to build the political will within their country to enact climate solutions, including effective carbon pricing policies. Ultimately, this in turn will hasten global synchronization of, global, of carbon pricing policies. I'm Canadian. So of course I have to apologize. So <laughs> apologies in advance. We are not able to cover all the incredible CCL achievements in 55 countries over the next 30 minutes. We are just scratching the surface. I want to thank all of our volunteers globally for being on the journey with us. 
So these are the following important maps and resources. Okay, so I, I went to the CCL map on the chapters around, the, uh, uh, for chapters around the world and I cut all the countries and continents that we had and I put them all together here just so you could get a better idea of where the various chapters are on the various continents. And I am excited to say that Citizens Climate Education now has a total of 12,220 international registered supporters in 55 nations. And we have 105 international active chapters in 33 countries. That is outstanding. How many countries price carbon or have plans to implement carbon pricing or have carbon pricing in their naturally, nationally determined contributions? Well, there are a couple of resources for that. First, anyone who's following global carbon pricing will become, should become quite familiar with the carbon pricing dashboard. And they are tracking carbon pricing around the world. And as you can see on the left-hand side, 46 national jurisdictions are covered by our carbon pricing. They're either implemented or scheduled for implementation. This is something that I learned at COP25. I did not know that 96 countries have carbon pricing in their commitments to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So 96 countries when have carbon pricing commitments written into their nationally determined contributions or NDCs. That is really exciting. And you can read more about it at this World Bank document here, States and Trends of Carbon Pricing. So at Citizens Climate Lobby, we build the political will for uh, climate action. But what does this look like? Well, it's a clear demonstration of support back home from citizens, business leaders, faith groups, and local officials. And to be effective, it needs to be widespread and focused on specific steps. So you have to imagine I've got countries like, I'm helping countries like Norway that have been pricing carbon pollution for 30 years, uh, same with Sweden. And then I have countries like Uganda here. Um, this is their training that they just had uh, last, earlier this week. Um, and they were discussing carbon pricing um, and, and approaching their government on uh, the, to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And here's, here's uh, some of the 22 people that were at this meeting that they were listening to over uh, chat. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's bringing people along on a spectrum. And, and it's just amazing to see how the different countries do this. So the following global institutions help countries transition to a low car carbon economy. Okay, um, so this is a really important global institution and Citizens Climate Lobby is one of the founding members. It was launched just before the Paris uh, climate negotiations in 2015. It was launched during UN Climate Week. Citizens Climate Lobby is one of the founding members and it's called the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And what they are, are groups of countries, businesses, and strategic partners, national and subnational governments, and Citizens Climate Lobby is one of the founding members, and they work together to share best practices on carbon pricing. So, for example, when I was at COP25, I went to three uh, carbon pricing leadership coalition sessions while in Madrid. One of them was about uh, business and carbon pricing and they had business case studies from South Africa, India, Europe, and somewhere in the Americas, I can't quite remember. And uh, the businesses found that when they internally priced carbon, they had the advantage over their competitors. So there was very exciting evidence that carbon pricing gives the businesses the uh, edge presented. And there's a book on that. You can actually go to this website and, and look for those case studies. The Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition also led a dialogue 
at at COP25 um, to uh, uh, about a just transition, and they shared best practices from around the world, including the British Columbia model, and how they've made it a very layered and thoughtful transition um, uh, and carbon pricing uh, put together. And there's also a guide to communicating carbon pricing that was produced by the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. As well, the World Bank um, announced at COP25 um, that they would be giving um, money to uh, countries in the global south to help them implement carbon pricing policies as well. So this is a really important global institution. And as you're going to see later on, a lot of our volunteers are working within, within this organization. So a couple other organizations that I thought were of interest, especially if you come from a country that is a bit of a climate laggard um, and you have coal, uh, is the Powering Past Coal Alliance. And it was launched by Canada and the United Kingdom uh, at COP23 in Bonn, uh, Germany in 2017. And they are, uh, uh, they set out a collective commitment to accelerate the transition from coal to clean energy. And Canada is one of the founding members and so is Norway and other countries and, uh, no, not Norway actually, uh, they're not on it because they don't have coal. But anyways, you can see all the countries that are there. And this is a, if you're from a country that um, is not part of this, you might want to consider join, uh, asking to join that. And lastly is the Carbon Neutrality Coalition. They're working together to develop long-term low emission climate resilient development strategies um, in, in agreement with the temperature increase limit. And they are all submitting plans this year. And those are the countries within the Carbon Neutrality Coalition. And the last two slides are about global institutions that monitor progress. The Climate Action Tracker is an independent scientific analysis produced by two research associations. And I constantly go there to see how various countries around the world are doing. Is the Climate Change Performance Index, which is a project of German Watch. And they have a slightly different ranking scale than the previous one. But between the two, you can get a good idea of which countries are progressing okay and other countries that have to do work. So I won't go into details, but I encourage you to look at them. Great, thanks for transitioning the slides. So now we're going to our stories from around the world. So, je ne parle pas français. I just said to you, I don't speak French. I understand French. I live in a community in Canada that is the most francophone community outside of Quebec and um, and our French speaking parts of the maritime provinces. I speak enough French to understand and I've been project managing in French um, my 20 years that I've been living here in Sudbury and all my three children are, are Francophone. They speak French as well. So much of uh, Western Africa, like Mali and Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire, they're all French speaking and um, we have this amazing group of volunteers, but it was hard to get pull them into Citizens Climate Lobby. So in October, we launched a chat group uh, called the Francophone Afrique on WhatsApp chat. And we have an ongoing dialogue with climate leaders in the Francophone speaking nations of Africa and uh, Jacques Kenjikpo, I can't pronounce his name very well. He is originally from Cameroon, uh, doing a graduate school in the United States, and he's helping me make sure that my French, um, I don't totally slip up, but um, the, the volunteers in, in the French speaking part of Africa have been really great about this, and we're pushing things along. So I've really enjoyed this group, and I'll have a couple stories to report about that. So that was new this year. And something else our volunteers do, especially our African countries and Latin American countries and even European countries in Canada, and I know it's also in the United States, they build parachutes for the planet. So they get giant pieces of fabric 
and they draw on them and then they use them for outreach. They use them for posing with politicians. Um, I love them. Um, they, they just, for me, I think they just open up our imaginations and they leapfrog over the, the blame and guilt and it just allows us to take action. And these parachutes that uh, groups around the world are building are meant to be a metaphor for a soft landing on the climate crisis. And this is the, late, the latest one that came in from Zimbabwe. Yeah, our leader there, Jusa, has just the most amazing artists um, as well. Just a couple other things. Our volunteers are also uh, around the world are involved in Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion in the Global South. And um, so for example, in Liberia, the Fridays for Future there have really, they got him published in a German newspaper of the work he's doing, uh, that Christopher is doing in Liberia. And Extinction Rebellion is uh, funding the travel of our leader in Zambia to go to the United Nations Africa Week in Uganda. So all these other organizations that we work with globally are helping our volunteers. So it's a really cool how we bring everything together. Of course, you're going to want to know about Canada. Okay, uh, we did it. Now what seems to be the question. And just as a reminder, you know, from 2010 to 2018, we went to Parliament Hill 13 times. And at that time, we had recorded over 700 lobbying sessions and had almost 3,000 media hits. And then while we were on the Hill, Senator Grant Mitchell, a climate hawk in the Senate, and one of the most lobbied senators on the Hill said to me in front of a group of volunteers, you are one of the most successful lobby groups I've worked with because you're about to get what you lobbied for. And then a couple of weeks later, the prime minister announced it. And it was super exciting and everything was like great. But if you really dig into the policy, yeah, it's great. We got carbon fee and dividend, but boy, it has a lot of improvements that are desperately needed. Um, the price halts at 2022 at $50 a ton. We are saying it must rise past then. We've done our research. Our volunteers are, are, are firm that we believe that the price must rise to at least $220 a ton by 2030. It needs dividend checks. We don't get a check. We get a line in our income tax. And for, frankly, most people don't know they received a rebate. Ultimately, it will need border carbon adjustments. A little country like Canada can't really enact border carbon adjustments. We need the EU or the United States to do this. And we'll do our best to encourage our government to go along with you. But it's really hard for a small country like Canada to do this. In the meantime, we thank our, our uh, Canada for working on bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. It needs to be harmonized nationally. Um, it's, 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 um, it's a backstop policy, but ultimately we're going to need it to be harmonized a lot better than it is and we need full cooperation of the Canadian Confederation of Provinces and Territories and political parties. We have all, still a lot of work ahead of us on smoothing the way forward uh, for carbon pricing in Canada and we want our climate targets and a bucket list of accountability measures enshrined under national law as well. Next slide. So just to uh, show you what it was like in 2015, Trudeau and the Liberals formed government. They uh, did the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. In 2016, the year 2016, we lobbied parliamentarians over 200 times. We went to Parliament Hill three times as a group, and I went a fourth time and got caught in a snowstorm. That's another story. And then zipping forward, we started getting our dividends. If you filed your income tax early, you got them in March of 2019. And then the carbon fees began in April of 2019 in the provinces and territories that have the backstop policy. And then we went through an election and two thirds of Canadians voted for parties with carbon pricing. Um, you might note that Trudeau has a minority government. It's a strong minority government. Um, it could fall. That means it, he could be lost, lose the government to a non-confidence vote, but it's a pretty strong minority government. So it's, it's a hard to imagine anything will happen in the next two to three years, but we should not take that for granted. And then lastly, we are going to be working on improving cash Canada's national carbon pricing policy. So 
the United Kingdom. They are dialoguing with a UK think tank that is writing a white paper that will make recommendations for the next phase of the UK uh, uh, for the UK carbon pricing policy. Stay tuned. I was in those dialogues. Thank you, Louisa. She's right there beside Ted Halstead. Um, CCL Germany, been around for a long time. That's them on their lobbying day in May 2016. They're again lobbying in May and they continue to build relationships with members of parliaments. I don't have any hard numbers to give you, but they are slowly chipping away and they are finding uh, as time goes by, more and more politicians are warming up to carbon fee and dividend in Germany. Denmark, um, I don't know if you know this, but Denmark has a, a uh, a goal to have 70% reduction in their greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And our volunteers in Denmark are working with economists uh, uh, to, to uh, do a report about carbon fee and dividend in Denmark. Uh, and that's carbon fee and dividend without border carbon adjustments. Um, like Canada, a small country probably has to consider border tax adjustments will be difficult and they're also working with a major organization to make visualizations on the consequences for big companies and medium-sized companies with the and the aim is to encourage companies to advocate for carbon fee and dividend or at the very least not advocate against it next slide please there's so many countries to go through um, Mexico, this was so awesome. We were at COP25 in Madrid and Jorge Martinez on the far right there got us a meeting with the, with the Mexican delegation. Um, it was a meeting of minds. The Mexican carbon pricing policy in many ways is like Canada's um, and we ultimately shared data uh, all, all of what's going on in Canada and um, Mexico is uh, one of our trading partners in NAFTA and we were just it was like a love-in. It was a carbon pricing love-in between Canada and Mexico, and Joe was there to uh, watch the love happen with us at, at, in Madrid. This is uh, Laura Morales. Um, she got to meet Marshall Saunders last um, June. It was a beautiful meeting. Um, and Colombia uh, is uh, participating in roundtable dialogues with their government and what they are having, what is called the Great National Conversation. They're contributing to the climate emergency declaration for the Bogota Council. And as you can see, Lara is quite young um, and they're involved in their Fridays for Future as well as Youngo and COI, which are United Nations affiliate climate agencies. And they were doing quite a bit of work in the lead up to COP25. Oh, if you were at the meeting in Washington DC in June, you remember this woman with beautiful fuchsia red hair, that's Angelica Flores Rodriguez. And um, she continues to lead uh, uh, with her friends, uh, her cohort there in Chile, monthly Latin um, uh, meetings, as well as coordinating monthly with our Latin American coordinators, Tammy Kellogg and Isati, Isati Citron. Um, they meet with politicians and they were involved in very important official civil society events for COP25 in Santiago um, where it should have been held, but obviously it, it was moved to Madrid. New Zealand was launched in April um, by CCL members from Ron Riley and Roberta Baker. And the leader there is Andrew Fraser, and they have been lobbying, they've commissioned reports, they're producing a white paper, and they're patiently building political will for carbon fee and dividend in New Zealand. New Zealand has cap and trade currently, so they're slowly chipping away at it. And Australia, in addition to their ongoing national and regional conferences, they are building alliances um, within major corporations to ultimately get their hopefully get their country to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Imagine, I'm missing a whole bunch of countries. Um, this is super excited. This just got launched earlier, well, last week, late last week. Um, CCL Africa has launched a campaign for their leaders across Africa to ask their countries to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. I know I'm going to miss some of the countries that have done this, but right here on the left is Nigeria and on the right is uh, Zambia. So that's Ibrahim Joseph at Precious. 
uh, Columba and she has a baby strapped to her body and they are bringing their letters to their governments to ask them to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, um, as well Togo, Liberia, you, uh, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, and a whole bunch of other countries of, have, have been submitting letters to their government to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And this is all part of a grand plan um, coordinated by our amazing leader there, David Michael Turungwa, um, to get their volunteers to do a series of actions that will help build political will towards getting their countries on track for carbon pricing. And you can go back and read this. Um, but in October, all of Africa is going to, all of our African volunteers on the continent are going to be asked to lobby their governments. Okay, thank you. So thank you everybody for the, the opportunity to talk you through uh, what we've been doing in Europe recently. Um, I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour and a flavour of uh, some of the opportunity that we can see at the moment. Um, so the first slide here that you can see is the Belgium team and what they're doing is collecting signatures for the European Citizens Initiative that we launched last year. Um, effectively what the initiative does is it gives us a legal basis to approach the European Union on because you can't have an initiative in Europe unless it passes uh, legal checks that they can uh, legislate and that it meets the European treaties for the European community. Politically Europe is slightly different to America um, we have a voting democracy based on proportional representation, which means we tend to have a much wider spectrum of political coverage. This is a, a nice picture of the European Parliament and roughly 700 uh, legislators across a spectrum of three large parties in the centre and four or five smaller groups to the left and right. Um, because we use a system called proportional representation, uh, that means that we don't have the direct relationship with our legislators just by geography. So we tend to approach them more on their functional role. So a lot of the work we've been doing has been how to identify the key legislative influences in the area we want to implement policy. So I'm going to take you quickly through that. There are a number of ways we can identify which people are the right people to talk to. Uh, this particular one looks at their authority and their role. So those major colored graphs are now in a table. And what we do is we highlight the party group leaders responsible for the party group's policy in environmental legislation. There's a similar party group of coordinators in it for a number of other policy areas, but for us, this is a key group. Um, we can then look at the types of work that people do. So we chose to assess the amendments and motions written for the COP legislation in uh, November and December last year. It's about 300 amendments on 150 pages. And effectively what we've done is we've identified the key amendment numbers and rated how closely those amendments fit the legislation that we're looking for in carbon fee and dividend. So by this method, we were able to uh, work out which uh, MEPs were active and looking at policy, which was well aligned to the work we were doing. Another element of, of targeting people is to look at the timing of schedules because the MEPs only meet in Brussels or Strasbourg in certain weeks and then they have to go back to their home countries at other times. There are some other committee schedules which tell you when the particular uh, focus groups are working. So there's a timing element to what we do as well. So in November last year and then again uh, a couple of weeks ago in February, um, we uh, coordinated a lobby team from across Europe to travel into Brussels um, 
some of these people sat on a bus for over 24 hours to get there is the level of dedication. Um, we spent three days in Brussels, um, both training and working out how to cooperate and then delivering lobbying sessions. The legislation that's currently pertinent in Europe, uh, which you may have seen as part of the new parliament that was voted in uh, late last year, is called the European Green Deal. Um, what the slide here is showing is some of the key phrases uh, that we've pulled out of the framework legislation, um, which basically gives us a green light that this is the right policy for us to target with carbon fee and dividend. Because many of the phrases there fit the legislation. Once the team got together, um, we basically did the same sort of thing that you all do in Washington in June. Uh, we look at individual motivation, we balance and set up the teams for the lobby sessions, we look at the lessons from previous sessions, particularly the common questions that come up. For us in Europe, that's largely around things like the energy trading system, which is Europe's carbon pricing, uh, the border carbon adjustment, and a huge amount of interest generated by uh, the work of CCL Canada, because they've implemented the legislation. Um, we also spend time looking at process and structure, and we also look at motivational interviewing, much as you do. This is interesting um, purely because it shows the curve of influence on legislation development. And effectively, although you can't see it on the graph on the slide there, we are at the top right. So now is the key point in time for CCL Europe to be influencing this legislation. So these are the results from the uh, lobbying sessions in February. And what you can see down the left are the party groups that we've met with. And next to that, you've got the number of legislative officers that we've met with. Thank you for that arrow on that. The next column across is one of the key environmental committees. So each legislator will sit on a number of committees. But what you can see here is that the majority of the people we've spoken to are actively working on environmental legislation. The next committee, ITRA, the next column across, is the industry, trade, research and energy. Um, which our assessment is, is the second most important legislative area for us to focus on. So in terms of how we see Europe's influence on global policy, um, for us in Europe, Europe is actually, although it's about 15% uh, of the global economy, one of the three major economies in the world, the actual emissions from Europe are relatively small at sub 10%, but if you count them by consumption in the economy, it's much larger. What this means is Europe's influence on carbon pricing through the border adjust adjustment is much more significant than the direct fossil fuels it burns. So we believe the border carbon adjustment, if it's set up correctly, will provide a significant influence on the trading partners that Europe has. So the priorities we have from the uh, lobby sessions we've got now is we have some significant opportunities to work with at least two of the major party groups uh, inside their own policy development, um, probably similar to the uh, house process for generating bills. We have a terrific opportunity to meet with more people in Brussels. We've We've had some meetings with the Commission and um, uh, active directorates within the European Union that have basically opened a number of doors for us. Uh, so for us, what we're looking to do is establish uh, both some of the specific policy elements we need and then stay on message as we talk across the breadth of the organisation. Uh, so here you can see the scaling of the lobbying that we've done. In November, we went in with six volunteers from five countries and met with eight different legislators. And three months later, we were there with 
14 volunteers from seven countries and met with 24 legislators. Um, our focus has been on the main three party groups because we believe that's capable of delivering a consensus on European policy. Um, and that there is a real pertinence to this work at the moment because of the alignment with the European Green Deal. So the last comment on the previous slide actually referred to the Chatham House rule. So, so here are some quotes from some of those meetings, but are, they are now disassociated with the individuals who made them. So clearly a set of, of terrifically promising comments uh, for the lobbyists to hear when you're actually sat down for the first time um, lobbying in the European Parliament. Um, one of the groups we met with said, you have literally met all of the key influencers, the dream team of influencers within our party group. Um, a second party group suggested, we really like the credibility and the integrity of the story you're telling here. We think you should contribute to a parliamentary hearing and we can invite you in as experts. One of the fun questions we picked up from the CCL training is to ask what a legislator thinks of our policy. And the expectation is you'll hear something like a four or a seven, and you follow that up with, well, what does it take to move the ball forwards and get a five or a six or perhaps an eight? And the idea is to identify the key actions for us as a lobby organization to take, to move legislators along the, along the scale towards supporting our policy. But there were at least a couple of meetings that we had uh, in February where literally MEPs opposite has said 10 out of 10, this is really good. It's, it's without having had the chance to do the due diligence. So we're not trying to get ahead of ourselves, but what we're hearing is very positive feedback. I, I can think, never, yeah. I thank you for that. Um, and I'll hand back to Kathy. That was a fantastic. Perfect. Loved it. Thank you so much, James. I get excited every time I see those quotes and those numbers. Um, you've just done such tremendous work in Brussels. Thank you to the team. Okay, so one last slide and then we can move on to the question all everyone should, I hope, was thinking about. Um, we also have a, not only grassroots mobilization, but we also do international negotiations. Um, and James and I were in Madrid, as well as 12 delegates from Citizens Climate Lobby. Citizens Climate Lobby was granted 12 badges, which is huge. Um, at these COPs, we, uh, Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, we do a lot of networking, a lot of education, and it was tremendous um, team building as well. So. Um, you can see the team with Isati Citron, um, Ross Astoria, myself, Sarah Juanes, um, Brigitte, Jorge, and Joe. Um, we got to meet um, incredible people. I don't know if you can see the uh, young African woman I'm there with. That's Vanessa Nakate from Uganda. She's one of the leading Fridays for Future youth on the planet. Um, there's myself with Canada's Climate Change Ambassador. And there's Ross Astoria and I with British Columbia's environment minister. Um, so those are just some of the incredible networking opportunities. I'm sure James has a, a huge bucket list that he could share as well. Um, um, we were observers. We spend a lot of time listening. It's really, and then we go and exchange notes and are trying to figure out where the ball is going and where can we keep applying pressure to keep things moving forward, especially with regards to car carbon pricing. One of the things we did new this year with Isati Sintron leading the way was we produced live from COP25 video series every single day on Facebook Live with a variety of voices, mostly youth under 35 and from around the world. They were amazing. And I think we'll be doing more of that. And for more information about our work um, uh, at the international level, working inside these sort of frameworks like COPS and, and other, uh, uh, please uh, look for Joe Robertson's upcoming presentations on CCLU. Uh, I'm wondering if anybody has thought about how our work internationally impacts your work. And I'm thinking there's mostly people from the United States. How is our work helping you? 
certainly from Europe's point of view, as we try to, as we see our legislators try to work out what to do with a border carbon adjustment, the potential to connect them with both Canada and people doing the development work in the United States adds a lot of credibility uh, to the work we're doing. So it, it really feels like standing on your guys, sh your, your, yourselves shoulders uh, when, we, when we work in Europe. From Europe's perspective, um, one of the most potent things is the scale of the US economy uh, because it's broadly similar to the EU economy. It provides a very credible uh, metric, um, although clearly not focused on the EU economy. Um, that's a real positive. Um, we have a couple of challenges like things like some of the internal tools uh, like Salesforce don't understand what Europe is and so we are listed as 27 separate countries but that's just internal admin and organization stuff but it makes us laugh occasionally. Yeah and inviting um, the international volunteers last June to the conference was such a, a boost to our volunteers who came and such a boost to the organization so thank you for that that was incredible. Uh, that was, I want to echo that. I, I, ha I had the for good fortune to be included on that and the exposure to the scale and atmosphere um, that exists within CCL US is really, really inspirational. It was so good. I would never go again. I would make sure other people from Europe went <laughs> so they could get a sense of it as well. It's that good. We're going to get there. Just have to visualize it and it will happen. And it is happening. Like, look how many carbon pricing policies you have in the docket in your Congress right now. It's just a matter of time now. Any follow-up questions after you've listened to this, please feel free to reach out to us. Kathy's email is generously provided here. It's just simply kathy at citizensclimate.org. If you have a question for Europe, or for Africa or for some of the other regional blocks, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to forward it to those respective leaders like James. And you're always welcome to also engage each other on topics with international dimensions in our forums. And that link is provided here as well. So with that, on behalf of everyone uh, that has benefited from the leadership that you have provided and the really helpful and inspirational overview, thank you both so much for making time tonight to join us and really walk through what you have been working on across the world. And uh, we are just really excited to see what 2020 holds for all of these different countries and initiatives. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world. <laughs>